Good evening, ladies. It is good to be back with you all. A huge thank you to Pastor Jeff for filling in for me last week. And of course, Lisa as well. You know, got the team who takes care of everything around here. So good to be back with you all, though. Um, couldn't wait to dive into Romans 12 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Romans 12. And then if you want to follow along, so if you want to put a bookmark, or something in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be looking at that tonight as well. So the last time that we met, we had read about God's mercy towards the Gentiles and how that mercy would be used to draw his chosen people, Israel, back to him. Therefore, in verse 1, not only ties what Paul is about to say next to this point, of God's mercy bringing salvation to the Jews, but to his entire teaching from the very beginning of this letter. We're transitioning from the theology that Paul has taught to the practical applications that come from the theological foundation that Paul has laid for us. So verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So if any of you were here last night for the Wednesday night refuel, um, some of this passage might sound familiar to you. And I told Pastor Jeff last night as I was leaving, thank you very much for setting me up well for Thursday's Bible study. So Paul has already laid out for us throughout this letter the magnitude of God's mercy. Now he's going to encourage us, exhort us, instruct us, and teach us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice because of God's mercy. Paul urging us is an appeal to our will. We have the choice, in light of the theological foundation that Paul has laid out for us, to sacrificially offer ourselves to God. We choose how we will live for God. Our will is supposed to override our bodies. In an age where we hear, do what pleases you, Paul is instead saying, willingly do what you know is right. The body is a wonderful servant, but it is a horrible master. It is only because of God's grace and mercy that we even have the ability to live in such a way that our lives become a sacrifice to God. Holiness is not obtained without deliberation on our will. Sanctification is a lifelong process, but each progression is made only from a deliberate choice to move further away from our sin and move closer to God's righteousness. In this passage, Paul is drawing from the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. According to the old system, one had to offer a sacrifice to God in order to receive his mercy. The old order of sacrifice was to lay upon the altar an animal and offer its life for your sin. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice offered on behalf of us. He was the sacrifice for our sin. As a believer, our bodies are a living temple of the Holy Spirit. The third person of the triune God lives in each one of us. The word bodies represents the totality of one's spirit, soul, flesh, and mind. 
God does not want just our works. He wants all of us. But unlike the old sacrificial system, our sacrifice is a living sacrifice. We are no longer taking the life of another, but instead we are giving our life over to God. It is a voluntary response to God's mercy. The problem with a living sacrifice is we can crawl off of the altar. Remaining on God's altar is the best way to keep our bodies, our spirit, soul, flesh, and mind where they should be. God does value our physical bodies just as much as he values our spirit, our soul, and our mind. We are living temples bought at a price. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Paul tells us that our offering is holy, set apart, pleasing, and accepted by God. It is our spiritual worship. It is our fulfillment of service to and worship of God according to the law. As believers, we are priests who are identified with our high priest. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be holy, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then Hebrews chapter 7, verses 25 through 28. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. When we offer our lives completely to God as a sacrifice, it is a sacred service. In light of God's great mercy, it is only fitting for us to commit ourselves entirely to him without any reservation. If offering ourselves as a living sacrifice is our true and proper worship, Paul tells us that there are two ongoing activities that we must participate in in order to live sacrificially. First is we do not conform to the pattern of this world. Popular culture is in rebellion against God and his word. And Paul warns us that the culture will try to squeeze us into this way of thinking. And how we think influences how we act. As a believer, we have been transformed. The old is gone and the new is here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. How we live our lives today should be very different from how we lived our lives before placing our faith in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 tells us, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. And then in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, we are told that we have been rescued from the present evil age. Today's worldview and popular culture cannot serve as the model 
for our transformational living. The world's views are opposed to holiness. And as individual believers, as well as the body of Christ, we are to stand out from the ways of the world. We are to be the salt and the light, offering truth and love to this rebellious culture. We are to be in this world, but we are not to be of this world. Next, Paul says that instead of being conformed to the world, allow yourself to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is a war between being conformed and being transformed, and it starts in our mind. As believers, we must think differently than the world does. But rejection of the world's ways is not enough for lasting change. If our minds are not constantly being renewed by the word of God, we will eventually fall into the temptation of being conformed to the ways of the world. The world teaches us that our primary concerns should be our feelings and what pleases us. But when we live our lives based upon our feelings, we will be deceived into believing things that may not be true. If you have not ever asked this of yourself, I'm sure you have heard people ask, how do I feel about my marriage today? What about my job or my family or my church or my life? Every single day holds different circumstances. And if my feelings are based upon my circumstances, they are going to ebb and flow like the waves in the ocean. And those are not stable. As Lisa Turker says, feelings are indicators, not dictators. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Our feelings cannot be the foundation of transformational living. And if we live our lives based upon the things that we do, we will fall into the trap of doing what pleases us. Even as Christians, when we want to do what God has called us to, we can sometimes miss the point of the good works that God planned for us if our focus is on the works and not on Jesus. So many of us want the checklist. Tell me what to do so I can check the box. The problem with the checklist is that there is no heart behind it. And I'm not talking about the feelings, nor am I talking about what Jeremiah just said about our heart. I'm talking about that deep-seated emotion that drives our actions. And as a believer, that should be the love that we receive from God that motivates us to work for him. A checklist becomes a chore that eventually leads to lack of motivation as well as burnout. When it comes to our sacrificial offering to God, we need to stop asking ourselves questions like, how do I feel about this situation? Or what would I like to do here? But rather, we need to ask questions such as, what is true about this situation? And what does God's word say about this? The word transformed is where we get our word metamorphosis from. It's used in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew when they speak of Jesus' transfiguration. But Paul also uses it in his letter to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he says, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So for Paul, our transformation, our metamorphosis, and the renewing of our minds takes place when we spend time in the glory of God. This will allow us to discern God's will for our lives. And God's will is good 
because he desires the very best for us. And as we come to be able to discern God's will, we will also come to desire it because we will realize that his will is perfect and complete in every way. We could never improve on what God desires for his children. Verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So Paul knows how easily pride can infiltrate one's mind and heart. And a prideful attitude can quickly cause problems within the body of believers. Paul warns of becoming prideful, and he encourages this audience to think of themselves with sound thinking. So what does it mean to think of ourselves with sound thinking? Well, first we need to recognize and acknowledge that all of our skills, talents, and spiritual gifts come from God. They are not of ourselves. And when we understand that everything that God gives to us and everything that we are is a gift from God, it will help us to maintain an attitude of humility. Second, we need to recognize and acknowledge God has indeed gifted us. Each one of us has skills, talents, as well as spiritual gifts given to us from God. And not every one of us have the same skills, talents, and gifts. Some of us might wish that we had other people's skills, talents, and gifts, but God created each one of us uniquely, and he has gifted each one of us uniquely. We should never look down on ourselves for any reason. That is false humility. When we look down on ourselves, what we are saying is the creator has made a mistake. Whatever skills, talents, or gifts that God has given to you, you should be grateful for them and use them to the very best of your ability in ways that is going to honor the giver of those gifts. Third, we need to recognize and acknowledge that our faith is also a gift from God. It is not from us. From the faith that leads us to Jesus, to the gifts that he has given us to serve, all of it comes from God and not ourselves. So now that Paul has warned us of our pride, he is going to encourage us how to use the gifts that we have to serve the body of believers. Verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Scripture uses the metaphor of the body for the church. And just as we have one body, it's one body, but we have different members, arms, legs, hands, feet, eyes, ears, nose, you get the picture. The church is one unified whole with many parts. So as with our own body, each part has its own function. Our legs do not do what our hands do. Our eyes do not hear, our nose does not taste, but each part is necessary for our body to function properly. So if you marked your spot in 1 Corinthians and you want to follow along, you can. If not, just listen to how Paul um, describes the body in this letter to the Corinthians. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and I'll be reading from verses 12 through 27. He says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. 
For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. So within the body, Paul is saying, that there is unity along diversity within the church. Each one of us is an individual with personal likes and dislikes, skills, talents, and gifts, but corporately we are one, united in faith in Jesus Christ. There is unity within the body not uniformity. Paul tells the Corinthians that there is to be no division in the body, and this does not come at the expense of the individual, but as the body, we must recognize that Jesus is our common ground, and we should be moving as one to the rhythm of his leadership. The Christian life was always meant to be lived in community. There is no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. Verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Every believer has been given a spiritual gift. There is no exception. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit living within you, you have been given a spiritual gift. And these gifts are given at the discretion of the Holy Spirit. You can find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. And I just want to insert here. If you do not know what your spiritual gift is, I highly encourage you to find out. There are so many great free resources to help you find out what your spiritual gift is. And if you're not certain how to go about that, you can see one of our team members or you can email us at women at theoasisaz.com and we will be more than happy to help you with some of those free resources to find out what your spiritual gift is. So out of God's grace towards us, out of his grace towards us, he has gifted us 
so that we can build up the body of Christ and serve one another. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, this is in the context of Paul urging the Ephesians to live a life worthy of the calling that they have received. And then he goes on to list five of the spiritual gifts, saying that they have been given to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And then in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, we read, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Recognizing and acknowledging our spiritual gifts are from the Holy Spirit, given out of God's grace, should be a motivator to us to serve humbly, our brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no place for pride within the body of Christ. May we all choose to be faithful stewards of the gifts that God has given us. In verses 9 through 13, Paul encourages us how to relate with others, whether they are Christians or not. So verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. So first, our love must be without hypocrisy. If we do not anchor this one, the rest will be impossible. We cannot fake genuine love, and we cannot use the disguise of love for ulterior motives. True love is without pretense or hypocrisy. Second, we must hate evil. To love God and others with genuine love, we must hate everything that is opposed to God and his standards. Notice I said everything and not every one. There are many, many people who are opposed to God, but God has called us to love people. Unfortunately, culture has convinced us that acceptance equals love. We, as believers, must stand firm in the truth of God's word and not be deceived into believing what is evil is good. That might be what the culture tells us and wants us to believe, but that is not the truth of God. Third, we must cling to what is good. Genuine love for God should lead us to cling to what God deems good and beneficial. The word cling means to glue together, to fasten together, or to join together. So we can conclude from this definition that God does not want a one and done adherence to what he deems good. He wants us to completely turn away from evil and fasten ourselves to the things that he says is good. Fourth, we are to be devoted to one another in love. The word devoted suggests a family affection, and the word for love in this passage is the word brotherly love. So this uh, sentence could be translated with brotherly love have family affection for one another. And is that not what the body of Christ is supposed to be? A family. Fifth, with that brotherly love, we are to honor one another above ourselves. In other words, we need to show respect for one another and set the example of deference 
to one another. Paul similarly encouraged the Philippians in the same way. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, we read, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Sixth, we are never to be lacking in zeal. We are never to shrink back, hesitate, or be lazy in our diligence. Whatever we do, we are to do it wholeheartedly. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, we read, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Seventh, we are to keep our spiritual fervor, literally meaning being fervent or boiling in the spirit. A spirit-filled servant, by definition, cannot be dull and boring. Eight, we are to serve the Lord, and that is the calling on every single Christian. Our service to the Lord should not be dull, boring, and it shouldn't be drudgery. We are to serve our Lord enthusiastically. Ninth, we are to be joyful in hope. Our joy comes from the Lord. Our hope is a confident expectation. It is not an uncertain, wishful thinking. As a believer, we know what our future holds, so we can remain joyful in what is to come and not be so caught up in what is now. Tenth, we are to be patient in affliction. Because of the work of Christ in us, and the indwelling Holy Spirit, we can endure and be steadfast in the troubles and the pressures of this life. Eleventh, we are to be faithful in prayer. Prayer is our source for help to remain joyful, patient, steadfast. Prayer keeps us connected to God. The word faithful means to adhere to one or be steadfastly attentive to someone or something. Prayer is not a last resort. It is not part of our checklist of Christian duties. We are told that we must adhere to God and be steadfastly attentive to him. When we pray, let us make sure that we are asking God to give us the wisdom and the guidance and the strength that we need to do what he has called us to. Twelfth, we are to share with the Lord's people who are in need. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, we are instructed to do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. But now Paul is being a little more specific in his letter to the Romans by stating that we are to share with the Lord's people who are in need. And the need for help was just as prevalent then as it is today. God calls us to go to those who are in need and offer them assistance. We all have something to give, whether it is our time, talent, counsel, or finances. All we need to do is look around at our body of believers, and we will be able to see the needs of our brothers and sisters. You might be their prayer answered. Last, we are to practice hospitality. The word hospitality in Greek means love for strangers. And practice is an action word, and it carries so much more than what we tend to think of. When we think of hospitality, we usually think of it as a casual invitation to have someone over for maybe coffee or tea. But the word practice literally means to run swiftly in order to catch someone, to seek after eagerly. So really what Paul is saying with this is we are to eagerly seek out those that we do not know and love on them 
with the love of God. The author of Hebrews tells us, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Hospitality is a big deal. That passage is Hebrews chapter 13. We should be. There we go. Okay. So, sorry for the video and sorry for you all, ladies. Okay. The passage was Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. So, Paul has laid out for us how we are to relate to people, not just our friends or our family, not just the people that we know who share the same views as us. God's people should act very different than people who do not know God or who do not have a personal relationship with him. So I want to ask you, how are you doing in relating to others the way Paul has laid out for us in this passage? So the following verses deal primarily with how we respond to others' actions, whether they are believers or not. So verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So first, we are to bless those who persecute us. It is not uncommon for our flesh to react to persecution with hatred and retaliation. But as one who is walking in the love of God, we are to instead bless those who seek to harm us. We are not to repay evil with evil. Stephen was one example from scripture where we see someone blessing their persecutor. Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, He fell asleep. We see this very same attitude in Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then Jesus taught on this very subject in his sermon known as the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Jesus says, But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When someone seeks to harm us, instead of bitterness or retaliation, Scripture is saying to look to God and ask him to bless them. Second, we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn and be willing to associate with people of low position. Empathy demonstrates a genuine love that we have for others. We are not one against the world, but one big family who comes alongside one another to care for each other. Not being conceited or proud is what allows us to have empathy for others. When we set our minds on eternal things, and we are willing to associate with the humble, we are in fact imitating Jesus. Third, 
we are to live in harmony with one another. Remember that the body is made up of many parts, and there is not uniformity within the body. This means that there will be times that we disagree with our brothers and sisters. And the world is certainly opposed to us and our beliefs, so there will always be tension between us and the world. However, as believers, we are called to live in harmony with others. And Paul does recognize that limits exist, and that is why he tells us, if it is possible, so long as it depends on you. You see, we are responsible only for our own responses and our own actions. So we must do all that we can do to live in harmony and at peace with others. And this is less about accommodating another point, another's point of view than it is at arriving at a mutual agreement about God's ways and God's standards. Fourth, we are to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now this sounds like a very huge monumental task because we all know that we cannot please everyone. I really appreciated how the New English Translation put this, um, this verse. It said, consider what is good before all people. For me, this takes out the um, task of being a people pleaser. If I am walking in genuine love of God, then I am going to consider how my actions might be perceived by others. And I am going to choose to act in such a way that is for the good of others. I'm not trying to act in ways that I think people want me to act. But rather, I am acting in ways that I know is going to honor God and be respectful of other people. So now Paul strongly urges his audience not to take revenge on their enemies. Verse 19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Vengeance is not for the believer. If we truly trust in God, we will have no need to avenge ourselves. God has called us to many things as believers, but divine retribution is not one of them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 tells us that God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. God does not need our help in this area. We can trust that God is going to take care of our enemies. So with that being said, Paul tells us instead of being vengeful and taking revenge, he says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Wouldn't you like to just say, can we just not retaliate? Do I actually have to do good to my enemy? The answer is yes. This goes back to our genuine love. God loves our enemies, and so should we. Can I give us all a little bit of caution here? Loving our enemy does not mean that we intentionally place ourselves in harm's way or that we purposely seek out a relationship with someone whose intentions are to harm us. We can love with boundaries. That is biblical. 
So Paul tells us that when we respond with this type of genuine love, there is going to be a burning conviction brought on by our kindness. The best way to take down our enemy is to love them. Don't add fuel to their fire. Instead of allowing evil to find victory in our lives, let us choose to defeat evil with good. Our most powerful weapon against the powers of evil is the power of good that we have in us because of God's love for us and his indwelling spirit. We are called to live out of the victory that Jesus died for. When we live as Jesus did, good will eventually win. And while all is not good in this world, God is still on his throne and there will be a day when good will completely conquer evil. So until then, if possible, as long as it depends on us, let us boldly demonstrate transformational living. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have given us your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit is the one that empowers us to be able to live out a life that is sacrificial, a life that truly demonstrates the transformation that took place in us. Lord, sometimes when we read your word, it can seem a little overwhelming and impossible, which in our own flesh, it is. Lord, never can we out of our own flesh love our enemies the way you have called us to. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit living within us that we can do what it is you have called us to do. So Lord, I pray that as we leave here tonight, that this message will so resonate with us that you have engraved this message on our hearts, that we will know that your spirit empowers us and that we will be able to go out and live a life that demonstrates your love, that we will willingly choose to live in a way that is a sacrifice to you. Lord, may everything that we have to offer to you be a pleasing aroma to you. Lord, that is all that we want. We want to serve you humbly. We want to honor you because you are so worthy of all honor and all glory and all praise. And Lord, we want to serve our brothers and sisters. And as a body, may we serve our community so that they will see the wonderful, magnificent love of God. I pray all of these things in your son's name. Amen.